uh, Master of Science in Environmental Studies at uh, Green Mountain, Green Mountain, I'm sorry, Prescott College, lately at Green Mountain College. Uh, and I'm happy to sponsor this webinar uh, by Bill Troop. I'll be introducing him shortly. First, I wanted to introduce you to Fiona Galt, who is on this webinar with us, and she's our admissions director for the Master of Science in Environmental Studies. And if anybody would like to receive information about our program, you can just type your email in the chat and she will collect your information and she will be in contact with you. So thank you. I would love, I'm very happy to introduce William Troop, who is a longtime colleague of mine and an exceptionally good teacher and a there are just a lot of really interesting things. He's a member of the Prescott College uh, graduate program faculty and emeritus pro professor of philosophy and environmental studies, Green Mountain College. Bill served as Green Mountain's provost for 12 years, during which time he built the reputation of the college for sustainability education, and he led the creation of its very successful graduate programs as well. He's published widely in environmental ethics and ecological restoration. He served on the board of directors for the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, that's ASHE for those of you who know, for six years, and he was elected as chair of the board for his last two years during that time. His current book, of which this is a piece, Flourishing in the Age of Climate Change, explores the character traits that we need to, bu to build to develop in order to successfully address our sustainability challenges and the role that education can play in cultivating these traits. Uh, he'll speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll take questions. Um, so welcome, welcome to the webinar and thank you, Bill. Well, hello all. I'm really glad to be here with you uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to some genuine conversation. As Mariel said, I'm a philosopher and that's where a lot of the work gets done is an interchange so don't be shy about sending in questions as we move along and uh, and I'll move through the talk with some speed uh, so that we have time for discussion uh, as Muriel said this is part of a larger project and hope is one of those character traits that I think is tremendously important uh for us now and what this talk is is an argument both for the importance of hope and for what the skills of hoping well are and just a little bit on how we might acquire those skills and a lot of people have written on hope uh, my particular contribution to the literature on hope is this focus on skills uh, I think we often misunderstand concepts like hope, and I'll say more about that as we go along. So let's jump in. We are having a test. Uh, it's a resilience test. And the background for what I'm going to talk about today is socio-ecological resilience theory. And I won't say a lot about that, but I will say a little bit about that. Uh, and so the test is, are we resilient enough to deal with the pandemic, to deal with uh, climate change? Those are my two examples, but they, I could multiply those, biodiversity loss, human population growth, and so forth. Uh, so Rihanna Gunn-Wright, as I was thinking about uh, how, how I wanted to frame what I was going to talk to you about today, I read this editorial by Rihanna Gunn Wright. And the title is Think This Pandemic is Bad? We Have Another Crisis Coming. And that other crisis she was talking about was climate change. And it, it was a startling uh, uh, op ed because she, she drew some parallels the need for global collaborative behavior. Uh, the potential for tremendous, uh, looks like somebody could mute here, uh, potential for tremendous economic harm and death. Uh, and she starts, the very first sentences in her op-ed are as follows. 
on the last day of Friday in March, I lost hope. I have always believed in America, she says, not in our inherent goodness, I'm too black for that, but in our sheer animal will to survive. And then she goes on and she talks about why she loses hope. And, and it, she saw Republican senators debating the stimulus measures that were gonna provide people what they needed to get through lockdown. Uh, and these uh, senators were saying that the Green New Deal, which Gunwright had worked pretty hard on, was the reason that millions of America would Americans would not receive the help they need. Now, what she's really talking about there is that all of a sudden we polarized uh, this debate, and it seems like we are reducing our chances for getting through. Now, can we afford to lose hope? I don't think so. And I don't really think she loses hope in the sense that I'm talking about. But here's the psychological puzzle I want us all to think about today. How do we motivate effective action when the <laughs> deepest problems we have to relate to seem beyond our control? And that is the case certainly with climate change and arguably with the pandemic, at least for us individually and in small groups. Now here's the puzzle. If we downplay the severity and difficulty of these problems, we might act, but we're not gonna act aggressively enough. And we've seen some of that in the pandemic case, especially early on. But if we're honest about how great the challenges are, then we're gonna have to talk, say that it's gonna be very hard to accomplish what we need to accomplish. The probability is low. And the worry there is people are gonna give up. And that's arguably increasingly what's happening with climate change. So how do we navigate through that, uh, that thread the needle between those two? And my answer is cultivating the skillful habits of hope. So, Here's some questions I want you to think about as we go through the talk. I want you to think about cases where you have done something that was really hard for you to do, surmounted some challenge. And I want you to think about what skills you called on to do that. And what made it hard to call on those skills? What skills do you wish you'd have? And to think about how you might foster the skills that you wish you had. And again, I'm going to be talking about some of those. And it's not just a personal matter. How do we help others have those skills? And how do we avoid reducing their capacity to hope well? So I want us to, we'll come back to this, these questions. And if you don't come up with them, I'll address some of them as we go along. But here's my little bit on resilience theory, the adaptive cycle. I hope uh, some of you have heard about this. This slide is from uh, Gunderson and Holling, uh, and it's a model for systems change, adaptive change. And just to give you the image of the model, you usually take the lower left-hand corner, the R section, and I'm going to use uh, uh, old field succession uh, to be my example. You start in that growth and exploitation phase with a lot of resources available in the system. And as a result, things grow very quickly and there's tremendous uh, activity in the system, uh, competition, uh, seizing of the opportunities that are found. So you, in the old field succession, you've got goldenrod, you've got uh, blackberry coming in, you begin to get aspen and birch, and you move through into the conservation phase when more and more of those available resources get locked up 
in hardwood forests in the northeast oak hickory maple growth slows down the system becomes more hierarchical uh, in some ways it's it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, an optimal port place for the system to be but it's also slightly more fragile it has reduced flexibility and adaptation uh, and then something happens that the system is not fully prepared for like a forest fire or disease and you move through collapse or release and release is just a gentler term for the system sort of unfolding the resources becoming available there's a fair amount of uncertainty about what's going to happen with the system and then you move through that phase you begin to reorganize there's a lot of innovation and some of the things that happen in the system. Some of the species that come in actually grab hold and begin to grow. If they're invasives, you're gonna have a system that's somewhat different from the system that was there before, but you begin that next phase of growth and conservation. So that's the model of the adaptive cycle. And this second slide is the social version Gunderson and Holling thought that this applied not just to ecological systems, but socio-ecological systems. This slide is from Brian Fath's 2014 article, applying the adaptive cycle to social systems, in particular organizations, uh, like companies, schools, nonprofits. And you got the same model only you can see now that it's not a linear growth pattern, but a lot of back and forth as the system moves towards, uh, towards conservation. And then once it gets into conservation, often you get crises which the, the organization can deal with, and it remains in the conservation phase but sometimes a crisis pushes it over a threshold, a critical threshold, and that's when you move into uh, release innovation and you come back. So if you wanted an example of that, Kodak, uh, an old company, still around interestingly, right? Associated with analog film and analog cameras went through this tremendous growth phase in the last century. Became very large, prominent company. Many, many people had Kodak cameras. And the crisis was the digital, the arrival of uh, digital cameras and particularly the cell phone uh, with its cameras and they weren't ready for it. And it did push them over a threshold. They filed for bankruptcy and they have been working hard to innovate, to stay alive, to get on a new growth phase. So we see that and sometimes organizations just don't stay alive, right? So that would be full collapse. Now the question here is where are we culturally now? And I want to argue that on multiple scales, we are in the conservation phase. Over the last hundred years, we've gone through tremendous growth uh, and locked up a lot of resources, become much more rigid and hierarchical, and are having a much harder time adapting. And I think that's, we see this with the pandemic and with our supply chains. Uh, the, and our, our globalization, and we certainly see it with climate change and the difficulty of getting 177 countries together to figure out how to fairly address the climate crisis that's upon us. But there are many other ways in which we're bumping up against planetary boundaries that make threaten to push us over a threshold. So 
what do we do when we arrive at challenges like that? What do humans do? And uh, these are just a few colorful slides of, of things that don't work very well. Uh, well, sometimes we'd stick our heads in the sand, right? We, we simply refuse to look at what's going on and kind of hope it goes away. We've seen a little of that with the pandemic. Sometimes we do look uh, at what's going on, but what we see is not what's really there. Often it's a sort of motivated irrationality where we see something that we want to see, call that self-deception. Sometimes we see clearly and it just looks horrific. And we get into this, into despair. And despair is really just the belief that there's nothing we can do. We're screwed, to use the colloquial. And lastly, sometimes we just think, well, somebody smarter than me is going to come up with a solution. Uh, somebody is going to find a drug that will deal with COVID-19 or there will be rapid uh, uh, creation of a vaccine, or we will find a way to uh, jumpstart renewable energy and decarbonize our economy. Somebody else is going to do it, and I just have to wait. And the problem with all of those is that they don't foster effective action. Now, I think there's a better response, and that is that we cultivate the skills of hope. Hope, in this sense, is a character trait. And if, what I mean by a character trait is a set of skillful habits. Uh, and they're habits that enable us to regulate our agency, our ability to motivate ourselves to act. Now, what's distinctive about hope is that we do that even though we're acutely aware of our limitations, what's difficult for us to do, and of the potential for failure. And at the same time, that helps us deepen our sense of agency. So I'll just give you a quick, easy example. You know, in the world of sports, uh, a lot of teams, when they get far down toward the end of the game, just kind of give up. You know, they don't actually uh, push harder. But there are a few teams where are known for just coming out and giving it everything, and sometimes, surprisingly, overcoming the odds and winning. That would be a team characterized by uh, tremendous hope. Now, we often think of hope as a feeling, but I'm going to argue that it's this motivational disposition which is accompanied by a feeling. The problem here is that hope as a word, an English word, is often used just for the feeling. Uh, and it has nothing to do with motivation. I hope you have a good summer. Uh, well, I'm not engaging my action on that. So that's a perfectly good use of the term, but it's not the one I'm talking about. Sometimes we also confuse hope with optimism. Uh, so optimism is the belief that things will turn out well. I call that positive thinking. But that's very different from hope. Because hope is the recognition that things may well not turn out well, and the ability to engage your motivational force despite that understanding. It's tempting to say it's raw willpower, but then it doesn't look like a skill, or maybe it's a single skill. But the question is, how do we get that willpower engaged? And those are some of the skills. I'm going to be talking about. So let me sum, summarize. Uh, this is the first part of the talk. 
uh, as an argument. Philosophers like arguments. So self-deception and willful thinking are going to prevent us from taking the necessary actions to address our challenge. Despair is likely to accelerate the crises because we don't act. So it also prevents us from action. We need something that will fuel our sense of agency. And by my definition, that's just what hope is. It's that thing that fuels our sense of uh, ability to act. So that's the argument. C.R. Snyder is a psychologist who invented hope theory in the 1990s. It's a wing of positive psychology. And he did a whole bunch of research on different populations about the effects of hope. And here's his summary statement from 1995. Higher as compared with lower hope people have a greater number of goals, have more difficult goals, have success at achieving their goals, perceive their goals as challenges, have greater happiness and less distress, superior coping skills, recover better from physical injury, and report less burnout at work. The list could go on. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, you know, if, if we could get good at hope, to have that, we could do a lot. So how would we do that? Well, I think it's useful to break hope down into three sets of skills. You know, when we teach something like writing, we break it down into sub-skills, organization, paragraph, construction, uh, sentence structure and grammar, word choice. Well, so I think we've got to break hope down into skills. And these are the skills, and I'm going to spend time on each one. So the first set is regulating agency, sub-skills, things we can do to give us that motivational oomph. Part of their, these skills involve how we focus our attention. So we can shift our patterns of focusing attention. If we focus on constraints and past failures, that's going to make it harder to act. But if we focus on the goals and our past successes, that's going to make it easier. So learning how to do that when you need to. Rehearsing hopeful cognitions, kind of creating an internal narrative which reinforces motivation. And then this one is particularly important, developing multiple creative pathways for achieving a goal. Snyder puts a lot of weight on that so that you have confidence that if one doesn't work, you can move to the next and still manage to get to your goal. So that's an imaginative skill. How do you imagine these? And then the ability to access support. So I'm going to give you examples of these. And I'm going to ask you to think about kids, either yourself as a kid or little children that you know, and how they develop agency, capacity to act. They're constantly bumping up in the, their limits, in the challenges that they have a very hard time surmounting. I mean, just think about walking. That's tough when you're a little, little kid or learning a sport. What happens? How do they acquire that capacity? Well, somebody says to them, you can do it. They start giving them a narrative. They express confidence. I believe in you. Keep trying. When we fail, they support us. They help us interpret that failure. Get up. Let's try again. Let's do it a little differently. So you identify a different approach. Uh, so what happens, according to Snyder and others who've studied this, is we begin to internalize some of these skills. 
uh, we find that we have taken the, what was an external narrative and made it internal. Now, so here's Snyder's model, and, and I don't have time to go over the model in any detail, but I thought it's useful for you to see it. The most important thing to see is we start with our general views. This is on the left-hand side of the slide about what our abilities have been and what ways we can put things together to get things done, our pathways. And then we look at a specific thing we want to do, an outcome we want to achieve that's valued because of an emotion is set. And once we have that outcome, we begin to identify pathways. And at the same time, we assess those pathways for our ability to accomplish them. And then at some point, we get ready to act and this feeds back depending on what happens with the action. So you can see this as a whole pattern of thinking. And what it is to have high hope is to get very good at engaging that pattern, uh, expressing some of those self-regulatory skills. Now notice this way of looking at it, it's an individualistic thing. But the second set of skills I want to look at has to do with the role hope and community. This is Victoria McGill, McGear, who wrote a very good article called, called The Art of Good Hope. She says, hoping well has an interpersonal dimension. It depends on finding or making a community in which individual hopers can experience the benefits of peer scaffolding. Hoping well thus involves cultivating a meta disposition in which some of one's hopeful energy becomes directed towards supporting the hopeful agency of others and hence toward creating the kind of environment in which one's own hopeful energy is supplemented by the hopeful energy renewed in them. So what you're getting is feedback loops between you and your community, your friends, your family. And those feedback loops can be positive. That's what she's sketching. We fuel others' hope. They, are, they in turn fuel ours. Or negative. Uh, and she thinks we've got to really focus on those social skills linked to hope. So what are they? Well, some of the sub skills have to do with just communication. Now, when we're in a tough situation, it's natural to communicate a, just a rah-rah, we can do it. Now, it's not that bad, it's not that hard. But the problem with that is that it may sugarcoat the realities. And then when we bump up against them, we're stopped because we haven't anticipated them. So figuring out how to communicate hope without your coding. Often it involves helping people understand the dynamics of hope and despair, the way we have in the first part of the talk, so that they kind of see how it goes because the argument for hope is a pragmatic argument. It's that it's better than the alternative. It's not that, we're warranted in believing that the outcome is going to be good. It often involves creating a small series of small wins. When I was provost at a college and trying to get something big going, you know, I had to start with little things that gave people a sense, okay, we can move towards this big thing. We can actually achieve it, chunking the activities. And often it involved orchestrating group interaction. They're not going to take it all from a leader so that each person is helping to fuel others' hopes about overcoming various barriers. So Martin Luther King Jr. 
I think is an icon of hope. I mean, tremendous hope skills. And his I Have a Dream speech is one of the great hope communicators of all time. And I think he, it embodies the skills I've just quickly sketched. The speech is extremely clear about the failures. He says, you know, black people were emancipated 100 years ago. This is a speech in Washington, 1963, March on Washington. 100 years ago, we uh, were emancipated and look where we are now. We, uh, segregation is still going on, tremendous discrimination. He lays it out. No sugarcoating. But then he uses a metaphor, very powerful metaphor. He said, we were given a bad check, but the bank of justice is not bankrupt. We can still take that check back to the bank and get the equality that it guarantees. And then he moves on and he speaks about our deepest motivations. And this is perhaps the most famous part of the speech where he talks about dreaming of little children, black and white, playing with each other. Black people and white people in the deep South sitting down at the table, sharing bread. And he goes on and at the same time, he talks about, you know, we have done hard things, we can do this. Towards the end, he says, you know, we can't despair. And we can't say, no, this won't work without violence, so we're going to have to, we're going to have to do things that harm other people. He also says, it's not going to work if we just wish that it happened. We've got to really work hard so that he covers all the territory we've been talking about. And, and it powerfully galvanized the civil rights movement. Now, this is the last set of skills. We're almost done and ready for conversation. You got to know how to judge whether hope is reasonable. And think about a person with terminal cancer. You know, you might hope that uh, we can get through this. I can be the one in a million. But if you spend all your energy on that, you might not be focusing on other things that you could hope for and actually accomplish. Uh, in terms of having a particularly good death, saying goodbye to the people who need to say goodbye to. So how do we learn how to judge uh, when to adapt to hope when a goal becomes impossible? That's a skill. We also have many choices where to put our motivational energy, too many things to do. How do we determine which ones are the most promising. So that's another skill. And then even if once we've identified the goals, there are different ways of framing the goals. And I'm going to give you an example of radical hope in a minute that talks about how to frame goals in smart ways. So there's a bunch of judgment. Uh, that one must have in order to hope well. And we need to hone those judgment capacities. So I want to tell you in short compass a story about Plentiku, the great Crow chief. And I'm taking this story from Jonathan Lear's article on radical hope. And Alan Thompson takes that article and applies it directly to climate change and makes the case, which I think is a very good case, that climate change 
is uh, best modeled as a requirement, as a need for radical hope. So what's radical hope? Well, I'll, I'll explain it by looking at the case of the crow. So there they are. It's a culture that has focus. It's a, it's a nomadic hunting culture, hunting and gathering. They have been battling the Sioux for generations and generations. They have acquired a focus on courage in battle as a way of expressing who they are. And the, the coup stick, planting the coup stick, saying no, no one who's not a crow can pass this point without suffering uh, death. Um, and of course, Plenty Coup's name um, is associated with this ability, this tremendous courage that he has. But he's looking at this white incursion, waves and waves of settlers, army protecting those settlers. And he concludes, battle is not gonna do this job. In fact, that's gonna lead to the annihilation of his people. And he has a couple of dreams. And in that dream, those dreams, the, the chickadee, the virtues of the chickadee, the character traits of the chickadee are lifted up for him. The chickadee is very adaptive, can move to different places, does different things. And he begins to envision a courageous approach to dealing with the white incursion that involves going to live on a reservation on a portion of their ancestral lands. And he convinces his people, despite the fact that fighting is kind of the way they address challenges, that this is better and it works. Uh, that's the powerful part of the story. Now, why is it radical hope? Because he can't quite envision how that life will enable the crow to still be who they are. He can't tell how they can still view that as compatible with courage. It sounds like somebody needs to mute. Um, and yet, he does it. Now, he frames this goal very generally. And in the case of radical hope, we don't know what achieving our goal really look like. And I think we don't know in the case of climate change what it is to rapidly decarbonize our economy. How much sacrifice, what must change? The pandemic, I, th I think we think we know, that's uh, an open question, what it would be to, to uh, actually conquer the pandemic. So maybe that's not a case of radical. But sometimes we have to be very careful to frame this in a way that enables us to still see we'll be the people we want to be, even though things are going to change in ways we can't understand. It. That is a deep form of hope. So how do we build these skills? I think educators have a big role. And I deliberately used the case of teaching writing earlier because I think that it's as important to teach hope as it is to teach writing. And Snyder has done a lot of work on how hope actually helps people succeed in education. People hire hope, they do better educationally. But how can we spread that across whole populations? Uh, I think we have to change the curriculum. We have to focus more on problems and solutions rather than just disciplinary knowledge. And when we do that, we have to talk about the dynamics of hope and despair. We have to help people understand how our immediate satisfaction culture makes it harder to motivate long-term action. I actually think Prescott's graduate programs do a remarkably good job on that problem solution type uh, curriculum so that they, 
you know, could it be better? Of course. But they actually work on these hope skills, often without naming it. Uh, I think that the more you do projects that get people to actually try and accomplish something in a classroom, <clears throat> the more they acquire the ability to think about different pathways and assess those pathways and to get their motivational <clears throat> energy up even when they fail. And you gotta scaffold the projects. And you gotta have a lot of practice and reflection about communicating hope. So I think we can envision <clears throat> what education would be like, not just about climate change or addressing pandemics, but about how we can enhance our hope skills. <clears throat> but we don't have to wait for education. There's an awful lot we can do, I think, on our own. And the irony, I think, is that many of us spend a fair amount of time working out going to the physical gym, getting exercise, trying to stay healthy, especially in the pandemic time. Well, how much time do we spend deliberately going to the character gym? And that's just a metaphor for really working out our own character traits. Well, what would it be? Well, it's practice, just as you, you know, when you work out for a sport or at the gym, you're practicing and reflecting on what's happened, working on improving them. I think we can all do that individually, but it really helps to have mentors and role models. And I think reading leaders who have been really good at hoping, like Martin Luther King Jr., really helps. They're role models, but it's good to find people, local people who you know, who embody this. And lastly, I think choosing your friends wisely and engaging them in that cycle that McGear talked about is incredibly effective. And often you've got to help people break out of the sort of downward cycles of cynicism reinforcement rather than hope reinforcement. Okay, so I, I have at the end of the slide uh, uh, the references, which we won't look at, but I wanna to return to the questions and I wanna hear your questions about, uh, and comments, does this make sense? Uh, and if so, what do we need to work on? So I've enjoyed giving you this brief layout what are your questions? And Mariel, if you want to feed some to me, that would be great. Yeah, thank, thank you, Bill. Um, folks, if you can go ahead and put your camera on if you're willing to share your faces with us. And you can unmute yourself to ask a question or you can type one into the uh, uh, chat and we'll voice it for you and kind of get moving on this. Um, I, I have one to get us started and, and that is how how does one recognize the kinds of problems where as an individual you can actually have an effect um, as opposed to just the wishful thinking piece? Right. That's, that's a, a really good question. And, and as a general question, it's, it's gonna be challenging for me to give a, a persuasive answer, but I think a lot depends on the specifics of the situation. Uh, so I'll give you some examples. You're, uh, if you think about Plenty Coup in that situation, he had a really tough call to make. Can we win in battle? And he had to avoid self-deception and say, I'm, I'm really gonna look at what's going on here, not just what I wanna see. So he had, to, he had to check himself, am I seeing what's there? And so I think one of the things we have to do is 
make sure that we're not seeing what we want to see. And, and then you have to know enough about your environment that you can kind of look at what you see and say, does that make this goal impossible or just very unlikely? The more important a goal it is, then the more reasonable it is to invest energy in it if it's very unlikely. So if it's not a very important goal and it's very unlikely, you might say, I think I'll do something else. But in the case of climate change, the IPCC is telling us it's very unlikely that we're gonna be able to stay below 1.5 degrees centigrade temperature increase, but it's very important. Uh, and so I think there we may say, we shouldn't give up and just move to adaptation. We, we have to do, pull out all the stops, double down, even as time shortens and say, it's still worth doing. So, so it's looking clearly at the facts, it's assessing probability and assessing the importance of your goal and putting them into a kind of a matrix and a lot of it depends on what else there is you can do. So those are, those are some variables that I think are relevant. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Mary Rollins. Uh, how, how do you go from rally around the troops to an MLK Jr. type of hope with people that you don't know well or who don't know you well? Yeah. So this is really a question about leadership. And I think it depends, of course, the details matter. If you're in a position where they're supposed to listen to you, <laughs> that is you're an official leader, or whether you're in a position of being a peer, and because you're, you know, you're, the dynamics of the leadership situation are much different. I'll take the second, because I think that's where, where many of us are. And what I find in very useful is to first be myself expressive of both the daunting challenges and why I think it's really important to act, to, to exude that degree of confidence in the allocation of my motivational energy. Because as McGear said, that rubs off on people, even if they don't know you well. People are attracted to motivational energy. Now, of course, you're gonna have skeptics. They're gonna say, oh, that's not worth doing. And then I think it's very important to listen carefully, to be respectful, to engage <clears throat> with such people, and to show them that despite their skepticism, <clears throat> that doesn't dent you. And in fact, to bring in other people who share your motivational energy. And that's that bit where you, you know, people are moved by other groups. The peer to peer is tremendously important. And, and <clears throat> when I've given this talk before, I've had more time, I've really talked about how each one of us is a kind of hope teacher. And we find those who I think we both, who fuel our hope and who are affected by our hope, whose hope is enhanced. <clears throat> and then we bring those people together with others who don't know us. And that creates this sense of movement. You see this somewhat on social media in some con in certain contexts. So those are a few answers that get at, I think, a really good question and a tough question. And sometimes it's just very hard to do. People don't know you. They, they don't know whether you're uh, Pollyanna, pie in the sky, wishful thinking or not. And so the first thing you have to do is say, I see the challenge clearly. And I, I have to I'll tell you from my own leadership experience, 
that's one of the hardest things to do. I'm a kind of an optimistic person by nature. And it's been something I've really had to work on to communicate clearly how daunting the challenges are so that I engage hope and not just tell people, oh, it'll all work out, because that doesn't engage the energy. I hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, are there other questions or observations or comments uh, from anyone who's All right, well then I'd like to thank Bill very much for being here to give us his wisdom <laughs> and look for this book coming out in. <laughs> Cornell University Press. Uh, don't hold your breath though, it's, it's a work in progress. <laughs> and I think this will be available as a recording as well. Um, yeah, on YouTube from our admissions folks and if you're interested for the link then you can just let us know. Uh, also if you're interested in any information about the Master of Science in Environmental Studies you can put your email in the uh, in the chat and we can uh, contact you and yes Mary you may share it. Uh, so we'll, we'll if you want to put your email in then we'll make, make sure that you can get the link uh when when the recording's available and i'm happy to share my slides for anybody all right well thanks to everybody for attending the meeting it was good to see you and thank you bill thank you fiona thank, thank you, you mary, mary.